this particular workshop considers production design of technologies that inhabit this science fiction universe presented in The Expanse by James Corey. In my opinion, I think the world building in The Expanse is absolutely amazing. The thing that interests me about the story is these two characters. You get narratives that incorporate characters that have to respond to conflict. And these personalities will either collide or they'll collaborate and then drama ultimately unfolds. Where the hell have you been? Come on, gonna get to the crime scene, gonna check out the clues. And the two characters I think that exemplify this quite well, Holden and Miller. But how would you actually describe James Holden if you were to describing him to a friend? He's the guy that doesn't want to be in charge. (laughs) but ends up in charge, decently good at being in charge, and is quite funny, actually. And he's also really principled. He's determined to save humanity. Absolutely determined to save humanity. Holden wants to save humanity, even at the cost of his own humanity. The character they seem to describe him is very intuitive. What'd you do? There's a button, I pushed it. Jesus Christ, that's really how you go through life, isn't it? And the other character you've got on the other side of this slide, you've got Miller. And if you were to describe mm-hmm. Miller, how would you describe his character? The nature of his job requires him to discover what he's doing by doing. <laughs> I kept telling him, I said, the store's in corners, kid. And if you don't clear the room, if you don't come in slow, that room will eat you. Mm-hmm. Of these two characters, which do you think would be better at problem solving? The intuitive, creative Holden on the left, or the pragmatic, structured Miller on the right? Neither. They best work together. You have someone who will vomit out ideas, and then uh-huh. the other guy will say, this one is good, this is not good. Both of these characters have characteristics that are required to solve a problem well. So you've got that intuition, but you've also got that framework. In the world of the Expanse, it's employed to tell an exciting tale of adventure. It spans the whole solar systems. You've got these three cultures in conflict, and then you've got these frequent conflicts that break out. And if they didn't break out, it wouldn't be quite as exciting a story. And you've got firearms that are involved from civilian to military. Do you think people notice that in a sci-fi, people are using what are essentially primitive weapons? Well, it's a tool that does the job. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Point at bad guy, pull the trigger, bad guy dead. <laughs> There's an example from 1760, and it's a, a lead ball. Yep. And then 150 years later, you've got the 1911 semi-automatic. 400 years after that, well, have hand weapons in the Expanse universe advanced much in the intervening centuries? That depends on how much is much. Over the 400 years since the 1911 was invented, mm-hmm. what would one imagine would advance in that pistol? Probably the bullet shape has changed. Okay. At least, maybe not the shape, like geometric outer shell of it, but the inner structure of the bullet probably changed. Muzzle velocity generally increased. Yeah. If that's the case, if we imagine that this handgun, it really doesn't change a huge amount over the intervening years. What is it that's so good about the solution that means it's still being used in the Expanse universe? It's what bloody it? simple. The, the simplicity seems to be a, 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 an essential feature. All the action takes place in environments that are fast-moving spacecraft or large stationary habitats. The environments that you see in, in the Expanse, are they or are they not vulnerable? Are the skins on these vehicles thin as paper or are they armoured? I think they're armoured enough that some space dust won't annihilate everything inside. Back to these two characters. And so you've got Mm -hmm. James Holden on the left and you've got Joe Miller on the right. And I guess you believe a fictional world, all the characters do have to face lots of different contradictions. And and I'm no screenwriter, but one Mm -hmm. assumes that drama itself thrives on each character's internal contradiction. And so you've got this character, James Holden, who's the hero. And he's honest as the day is long. He's a principled man and he's seeking to protect humanity from itself and from threat. I tried saving the world. Mm -hmm. And for someone who has such a care for the lives of others, why does he keep shooting people? So do his principles actually match his actions? You can understand protection of human life twofold. You can have protect all life or protect the life that doesn't try to kill other life. Can he get away with the idea of that he's fighting for peace? Yeah, I think so. And that again makes this storyline really interesting because you end up with a principled character who's uh, possibly conflicted. So James Holden is there saying there's a right thing to do. And Miller is there over his shoulder in his ear saying, you don't have a right thing. You've got a whole plate full of maybe and a little less wrong. 
wrong. And so again, you've got this principled, intuitive individual on the left, and you've got this pragmatic investigator on the right, moderating these principles and this intuition. Having a thing to do can be both right and a little less wrong at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that sort of position is this constant return to the idea of contradiction. Contradiction not being a bad thing. Contradiction being the essential driving force behind understanding what a problem is and somehow finding some mechanism to solve it. To take a simple example, and one you're very familiar with, is this one. Yes. A snapshot of some armed conflict within a space habitat. And if you'd never seen such a scene before, is someone likely to see anything contradictory in this scene? Not really depends on the gun, but it depends on how you use it. The details. It depends on the details of how you use the gun and what's in the gun and what's the, the armor and what's the airlock. and The things that you want aren't in contradiction. It's your solutions that are in contradiction. I've gone from something that looks relatively benign to trying to emphasize some of the features of these solutions to see if a conflict arises. And this is about as emphasized as I could make it without it seeming absolutely ludicrous. Previously, I would have said that contradictions arise as a result of our desires. But that's not correct. It's contradictions arise as a result of how we realize our desires. And so if we take another example like this one, again, the question mm -hmm. is, is there anything wrong with this image? Is there anything contradictory. What should have happened? And is there a problem in this scene that requires resolution? And you're probably quite right. The answer is it depends. But what would it depend upon? How strong the backwards forces? Absolutely. And all of the previous mentioned stuff just applied to the shotgun grenade launcher weapon instead of the big <laughs> So if we got this situation where an armed conflict breaks out on a space habitat, mm -hmm. potentially the opposition is armored or they're not armored. Our footing is not necessarily very secure. Mm -hmm. the, the weapon is this weapon that has been developed since the 1700s or earlier. Mm -hmm. What is it we want? What is it we want from this situation? What outcomes do we seek. I would need to assume that we need to win by somehow directly incapacitating the opposition. It's reasonable to assume that the opposition will defend itself. The primary means we know of that the opposition can defend itself is by doing to us what we want to do to them. But first, basically, I want to say don't get shot. We don't want friendly fire, I guess, or well, negative effect of our own weapon. I was thinking about not the environment, but the wielder itself. You know, Men in Black, the scene where the new agent shoots the cricket gun and oh, then yes. he gets blasted onto the car. Don't be harmed by your own weapon. Yep, that, that seems fair. Or at least make the landing as safe as possible. Shoot an HE round out <laughs> of the howitzer. You will basically detonate an HE round in your face. I'm just wondering if don't get harmed by your own weapon contains a number of different desires. By what mechanisms would you have in mind that you could get harmed by your own weapon? It exploding in your face. It exerting a too much force on you in a mechanical way. 20 minutes later. Neutralizing the opposition, you definitely have mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Protecting yourself from them so don't get mm -hmm. shot. So mitigate the recoil because that mm -hmm. recoil is somewhere going to harm you. I wouldn't include the mitigate recoil in that form because I don't really see the, the relevancy of this particular mitigate recoil in this form. Is, and is that because, as you've just described a moment ago, you already have a solution in mind? It's not really a solution, it's just a very obvious and very easy circumvention of the problem. And so if from your perspective, one of those benefits, mitigate recoil, it's trivial because there's already a solution that you have in mind. The solution is basically already implemented in the picture by virtue of having legs. It's not really a problem since it's already solved by the environment. Hold that thought, because we're going to use it in a minute. Mm -hmm. Later that same evening. If we take these five benefits that mm -hmm. we seek, before we start trying to come up with solutions, mm -hmm. what we would typically do is we would look at how the problem is currently solved. And the problem is currently solved in the Expanse universe with a pistol. So what we want to do before we move on to trying to think of clever solutions is actually describing the features of the basic technical solution. Mm -hmm. Because as you were describing with mitigate recoil, the problem is actually discovered in how you realize these benefits, yeah. not the benefits themselves. 
So if we go to these benefits and say, right, okay, let's take that basic technical solution. How does it neutralize the opposition? I'll say lead poisoning. Several bad puns later. Destroy insides or destroy organs. Well, mechanically, the bullet hits the organ. So would it be something like kinetic energy? Yep. That being the case, if protecting ourselves is one of the benefits that we're seeking, mm -hmm. how does the pistol, the mundane technical solution, mm -hmm. or the basic technical solution, mm -hmm. help you to protect yourself? Well, you've got a barrel, mm -hmm. a sturdy barrel at that. Uh huh. When you're seeing the phrase protect yourself, you're not saying protect yourself from the opposition shooting back, because you described yeah, before... Yeah, I'm seeing protect myself from the solution, holding basically a small bomb in your <laughs> hand. For me, this is the most immediate thing you want to protect yourself from. But robust manufacture is fine. What was your mundane technical solution to the mitigating recoil? You described how recoil wasn't a particular concern to you because, yeah, because you had... The, the scene already presents the solution, like with the gun. Are you suggesting that there's no need to mitigate the recoil of this gun? Yeah, it's small enough that you can try to swim towards the opposition and it would be enough or something, or brace against the wall. So mitigate recoil is not a particularly big problem in your eyes because yep. you can just use the environment around you in, in order to mitigate. Yep any reaction forces. So how about Bobby turning up? <laughs> if you've got the Star Helix pistol in your hand and you, you wanted it to somehow penetrate Bobby's armor, how would it do that? Well, there is a couple of mechanisms. Mm -hmm depending on how long you managed to shoot. In that scenario where you take multiple rounds and you try to drive a hole through Bobby's armor, how would you protect yourself from Bobby whilst you're doing that? The expanse showed is you can basically turn over the table and the bullets will just splash on the table. So I would like rip a bit of the table and oh. shoot from behind the shield. So basically in the expanse universe, because there's lots of small close spaces, there's plenty of cover. And then finally, the very last one at the bottom, the Star Helix pistol. By what mechanism does it leave the ship intact, should you say miss? Well, it just doesn't have enough energy to penetrate the hull. So the benefits don't necessarily contradict one another. Yep. But the how the mundane technical solution achieves mm -hmm. these benefits might uh, contradict one another. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that mundane technical solution, mm -hmm. do any of them actually contradict one another? We want as low energy as possible to leave the ship intact, but we want as high kinetic energy as possible to destroy organs. Yeah, so somewhere in between the two, there's yep. possibly an answer. But as one gets better, the other gets worse. Exactly. So, are there any others? Not really. No? Okay. If we wanted to be absolutely sure, mm -hmm. we would take those desires mm -hmm. and we would take those solutions mm -hmm. and we would just cross-reference them with themselves. This is one of the primary tools that I find really useful when doing concept mm -hmm. development is actually just take your desires, take the assumptions that one is making about mm -hmm. the solutions that deliver those desires and actually see if they contradict one another. Because this is the tool yeah, which yeah. I use to really focus on a mm -hmm. problem and really understand what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And so if we take your answers to these five benefits mm -hmm. that we're seeking, mm -hmm. you've already pointed out that two of them contradict the high energy required to neutralize the opposition and the low energy required to leaving the ship intact. And that would be number seven. If we want to destroy organs mechanically and with mm -hmm. a lot of kinetic energy, but we also want to leave the ship intact, number seven is a contradiction. And it's a contradiction because of the mechanisms that we're employing to realize those benefits. So are there any other ones on this matrix that actually contradict with one another? Recall increases with the energy We've got a gun. You could probably brace yourself against the wall and you'll be fine. But Bobby turns up. And now I need a heavier gun. The more armor I need to shoot through, the harder it's going to be for me to brace against a wall. Yep. And as a result, number six potentially is a contradiction. The brace against wall, you do not necessarily have to brace yourself. You can brace the gun and then just pull the trigger. That particular part of the conversation is why I find this matrix really useful. You had an assumption, and it's a perfectly good assumption, that mm -hmm. if you had a space clock, you could brace against the wall. You then cross-reference that against the other desires you have and the assumptions you've made about the solution. Mm -hmm. And you recognize that, number six, the more armor I wish to penetrate, the harder it will be to brace the gun. And you'll notice that what you've done, and it's perfectly legitimate and, and, mm -hmm. and desirable, is you've slightly changed your solution. So with that perspective, 
perspective in mind, can mm -hmm. you change any of the other numbers red with a logical argument? All the things that mention kinetic energy should you... probably contradict the low energy one. So number 10 for sure, robust manufacture, the gun might explode. The mm -hmm. less pressure in the gun, the better. And penetrate mm -hmm. armor. Does number five now offer a contradiction now that you've interpreted protect yourself as protect yourself from the gun? Well, penetrate armor does not necessarily have to be achieved with increasing kinetic energy. You'll notice that neutralizing the opposition and penetrating the armor you've described in the mundane technical solution as use kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. And now we start looking at these contradictions. You don't necessarily have to use kinetic energy. That's what we're going to get on to next. So before we yeah. start solutioneering, are there any more of these that you can turn red? We want to neutralize the opposition by using lots of mm -hmm. kinetic energy. And we've also got, we want to penetrate the armor by using lots of kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. So those two support one another. The yeah, better the, you get at one, the better you get at the other. Yeah, the eight and nine presumably also do. With the, with the solution at hand, they do. So we've got one, two, and three. What color would you make them? They can either stay blue because there's no interaction between the two. They can go red because they contradict one another, or they can go green because they support one another. If you're trying to neutralize the opposition with kinetic energy, but you're trying to yeah. protect yourself by the gun not exploding, do those contradict, support one another, or nothing? On the far left-hand side, it says, as we increase this, and it says at the top, do we harm this? So mm -hmm. as we increase the amount of kinetic energy we use to neutralize the opposition, does it make it more or less likely that the gun will explode? As we increase the kinetic yeah, yeah, energy that's... used to neutralize mm -hmm. the opposition, it will make it more likely that the gun will explode. Yep. As we increase the kinetic energy to neutralize the opposition, mm -hmm. will that make it harder or easier to brace against the wall? I guess it would make it harder-ish. Harder is fine. We're not talking about degrees of hardness here. We're just talking about whether if one goes up, the other goes down. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it depends on how we would define the... the and then finally, if we increase the ability to protect ourselves by making the gun as robust as possible, mm -hmm. does that make it harder or easier to mitigate recoil by, say, bracing ourselves against a wall? By using logic of the current guns, I would say that they support one another. The heavier the gun uh, of course, is, the less speed Felt it recoil. will gain. This particular slide is the absolute hub of everything I do when I'm doing mm -hmm. concept development. I describe the benefits I'm seeking. I describe how these are practically realized. I then cross-reference them against themselves. And mm -hmm. now I have a description of the problem. And the description mm -hmm. of the problem is described by the things in red. If you have red numbers in this matrix, that means that some of your solutions mm -hmm. contradict one another. And that means that you've got a problem that you can solve. Because we have numbers in red, there are features of the Star Helix Pistol that contradict other features of the Star Helix Pistol, mm -hmm. which means we have a trade. Whereas one thing gets better, another thing gets worse. And so you'll size them so that they are balanced. Yep. A little column A, little column B. The thing that I don't do in the early concept development mm -hmm. is trade. You'll have to trade eventually. But what we find is when we come up with a new concept, we try to make all of these numbers green. And if we can, we're starting with an elegant strategy that has as few engineering trades in it as possible. If all these numbers are green, we have the perfect solution. If any of them are red, we have an opportunity to make the solution more elegant. Everything previous to this slide is us creating a language between ourselves to allow us to describe mm -hmm. what the problem is. And everything after this slide is solution discussion. Discovery. From my perspective, contradiction is fundamentally the thing you need to find in order to understand what the problem is at all. Contradiction is where we find the problem. So what I would want to do next is then move on to solution discovery. And the first thing we really need to do with solution discovery is actually recognize a pistol itself is a great solution to the problem. So why would we not use many of the features of this in order to create a new solution? We've got a solution here that is a couple of hundred years old, and by the time we get to the Expanse universe, we'll be uh, 400 years older, and it's a great solution. What we want to do next is before we get to solutioneering, we want to understand this pistol better. If we're going to neutralize the opposition using kinetic energy, what is the specific outcome of that benefit? Why is using kinetic energy a good way to solve this problem? The kinetic energy itself was just a part of what makes the, the solution that good. 
the idea of firing something small and aerodynamic to deliver the kinetic oh, energy. The, okay. the, the mechanism itself is good. So it's a delivery mechanism. It's not the kinetic energy. It's the fact that we can deliver a kinetic energy easily. Is that yeah, right? That's great. That's great. The reason that the pistol is a good solution is not because kin kinetic energy being a mechanism to hurt someone is a good way of hurting someone. Mm -hmm. It's that it's a mechanism that's very easily delivered. Yes. So what's the physical mechanism that, that delivers that kinetic energy so easily? Bullet. Fast bullet, I guess. Very easy to accelerate something small to very high speed. Why that mechanism and no other mechanism? We need to hold it. Pollution needs to be small enough to hold. What we're doing is we're convincing ourselves mm -hmm. some of the features of the pistol are great and we'd want to keep them. So when we're protecting ourselves, and the way that you interpreted protecting yourself was we were going to make something that was so robust it wouldn't explode in our hands. So what's the specific outcome of that benefit? Well, you need to keep your face intact. Would it not be the case it's the same answer as above? We need to hold it. Yep. And what specific mechanism provides this protection that stops it exploding in our hands? Barrel. The most basic thing is the barrel. What is it about the barrel? What's the physical mechanism? It's round. It's a strong shape. So why? Why that? Why that mechanism and not any other mechanism? We need to separate the explosion from her face. It's closed on one side and it's open on the other side. So all the energy will blow out of the front and not out of the back to her face. We need to mitigate recoil and the specific outcomes of that is, you know, we need to hold it. And so <laughs> if we didn't need to hold it, maybe we wouldn't need to mitigate recoil. The bomb solves it differently. You just hold it at one time and then not hold it at the other time. So what physical mechanism provides this outcome? So you need to mitigate recall. So you're going to brace yourself against the environment. And the reason you need to do that is you need to hold on to it. And what is actually the physical mechanism that achieves that? The handle. So why is this mechanism required? We have to brace ourselves against the environment because we need to hold this weapon. And we have a handle on it. And we use our hands. And so why that mechanism and not another one? If we lose hold of it, we cannot operate it anymore. When we say operate it, is there any specific function you imagine is critical that requires us to hold it in our hands? If you didn't hold the gun in your hands mm -hmm. and you attached the gun to some other part of your body, mm -hmm. what would be better than attaching it to your hands in order to aim it? Probably nothing. The reason we need this mechanism, this recoil mitigation mechanism, is because we need to hold this device in our hands. Mm -hmm. The reason we need to hold it in our hands is because we need to aim it. Well, kind of a turret, and then we oh. don't need to hold it it's somewhere else. Well, like the well, the Browning machine gun, it's on a turret. It's one little step from having it operating it with your hand on a turret to operating it with a linear actuator on a turret. Well, that's true. The Browning machine gun with its tripod is literally bracing the machine gun against a wall, isn't it? Yep. You um... just have a turret in the front of the hallway. Ugh. And then we can make the wall move and we have a tank. <laughs> We have a tank on rails inside our own spaceship. And now what we've done there, we've elevated the function to the super system. Yeah, I'm just kind of like half joking, playing around with the thing. It's... Whenever people come up with really great ideas, it's always funny. People start to smile. People start to have a good time. Penetrating armor, the mechanism by which you could penetrate Bobby's armor is obviously kinetic energy because that's how you're neutralizing the opposition, but you would hit the opponent repeatedly. Why would you be hitting the opponent repeatedly with kinetic energy? What's the specific outcome of that benefit? With each subsequent hit, the armor gets weaker and eventually one bullet will penetrate the armor. Why not just do that with one hit? Well, because it will harm everything else. We need to hold it, of course. If each hit weakens the armor, and the specific outcome is nothing to do with penetrating the armor, you're hitting the armor repeatedly because of all the other benefits you're seeking. Yep. Your suggestion that multiple hits using kinetic energy to penetrate the armor, the specific outcome of that is so that we can hold the weapon. And what physical mechanism provides this outcome? Bullets. But in this case, many bullets. Why that mechanism to penetrate the armor and not another one? Because it's the simplest. Each hit weakens the armor, and we need to deliver this kinetic energy in parts because we need to mm -hmm. hold on to the weapon. Yep. 
what I wanted to say is that I thought about it a different way. A warhead inside the bullet, but that's uh -huh. just impractical. Another mechanism in a bullet oh. that will penetrate the armor. You mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. The reason I labor over the problem statement so much mm -hmm. is because there comes a point when you've stared at the problem so much, it starts to become ripe with solutions. We've got to that stage in here where we can't help but mention new and interesting solutions. So we've been talking about this pistol, but now we've talked about it so much, we can't help but say, but what if the bullets exploded? What if the bullets had these features? And when you've got to a situation where your problem statement begins to bleed into your solution, you know that you're ready to solve the problem. But before we do, let's finish this row, because one of our desires is to leave this ship intact. And the mundane technical solution achieves this by being low energy. It's a nine mil gun. What's the specific outcome of that benefit? What is it we need to leave intact? If we're going to leave the ship intact, which part of the ship? I think is the easiest answer is the important ones. All of the parts of the ship are very important. We can come to the quick conclusion that a ship is a minimal solution to a problem. Yeah, so the specific outcome of the benefit is actually to not harm any part of the ship. I mean, is there no part of the ship that we could accidentally hit? I was deliberating between the seats and the coffee machine, but the coffee machine is extremely important. And what physical mechanism prevents us harming any part of the ship? And why is this mechanism required? Why must we have such weak bullets? The answer might surprise you, because we need to hold it. We need to be alive to be able to hold it. From your answer there, I would expect that it's more important that we keep the ship intact than it is we defeat the opposition. Well, it depends. Or maybe you have a other minimal solution that just presents itself, like a space suit. So you just make the ship Swiss cheese and then blast off into space with a jetpack. Well, that's the solution that's presented actually in The Expanse, isn't it? Every time they go into yep. action, everyone gets into a spacesuit. Now they have their own mini spaceship. Yep. They've got a gigantic fusion reactor at the back of the uh, ship. Yep. If you put a hole through that, they all die. What assumption is shaping our thinking? So we wanted to neutralize the opposition, and we want to use a bullet because it's easy to accelerate something small and to high speed. We're making assumptions about the world and about the solution and about what's actually possible. For example, it's easier to accelerate something small than it is to accelerate something large. So what assumption is shaping our thinking there to say this is the best solution? Whatever is accelerating the bullet in the Star Helix pistol, presumably some kind of very futuristic space gunpowder, is just the most efficient way of accelerating the bullet. So we're protecting ourselves with a strong barrel and a strong shape. And so what assumptions are we making that's shaping your thinking that you lead you to assume that that's true? What assumption is shaping your thinking that a strong barrel with a strong shape is the way to protect yourself? It comes from the above one. Since yeah. we're accelerating it with an explosion, this is the way to contain an explosion. If we're mitigating recoil and we're using our handle on the device with our hands, what assumption is shaping your thinking that we would use a handle and we would operate it with our hands? Why? What assumption are you making about the world or about that solution or about what's possible? Can't have a gun that fires by itself. Penetrating armor, what physical mechanism provides this outcome? We're going to use bullets, but we're going to use lots of them. So what assumption is shaping your thinking about that? Why are we using lots of them rather than, say, one? Well, it comes from all of the above in it. We can't have one big bullet. Why not? Because then everything else will have to be scaled up. Each bullet is limited in the amount of energy that it can deliver because of all the other assumptions. Yeah, seems about right. And finally, leaving the ship intact, and the physical mechanism to provide this outcome is weak bullets. Mm -hmm. Why are we assuming that we must have weak bullets to leave the ship intact? The hull is weak. And also the subsystems. We're assuming that that fusion reactor at the back is also weak. Yeah. We've now absolutely squeezed everything we can out of defining what the problem is and why mm -hmm. the incumbent solution is good and why the incumbent solution is bad. And we've also squeezed out of ourselves what assumptions we're making that lead us to those conclusions. Have you noticed that the leave the ship intact part uh -huh. seems kind of glued on and the solution is basically perfectly viable without it? What we've discovered there is our top benefit. If it weren't for the fact that we were on a spaceship with a weak hull, this wouldn't be a problem. We could just use that pistol and we could just blaze away. 
If it weren't for that, we probably wouldn't have a problem. So now we move on to trying to solve the problem. What we're not going to do, find a balance where if you hunted to penetrate armor and you wanted to mitigate recoil and you penetrated armor with a really powerful gun and you mitigated that recoil by holding the gun in one hand, what you would do is you would find a gun that was so powerful that it would penetrate armor, but not so powerful that you couldn't hold onto it anymore. But in early concept design, we have an opportunity to not trade, to not trade between these two desires. We have a desire to penetrate armor and we have a desire to mitigate recoil, but they don't go together. We end up with a poor foundation to build a solution on. And both of these supports are perfectly adequate in isolation, but paired together, one will harm the other. And the way that we would try to solve this from a concept perspective is actually we would get rid of one, keep the recoil mitigation mechanism, hold the gun in one hand, and then we penetrate the armor with a great idea. You get two goes because you could actually treat it this way around as well. Actually, the penetrate armor with a high-powered gun, that's our primary column. <laughs> and the other side is the problem. Get rid of that one and have a great idea. It means we keep all the good bits of the solution. Mm -hmm. There's another way of looking at it. So imagine we had a graph and at one side we said we're going to penetrate the armor. We have to find some balance between the two. And that balance will cause our boundary beyond which we can't pass. So we could have a really, really high-powered gun, but mm -hmm. our recoil mitigation is terrible. The cricket gun from Men in Black. We could actually design something the other way around. We can say, right, we can have really great recoil mitigation mechanisms, but they're so good, the energy in the round is so poor, it doesn't penetrate armor at all. A nerf gun. A nerf gun. And everything in between that creates yep. this boundary. We could take either end of this scale and choose one. We know that a high-powered gun gives us everything we want in penetrating armor. And we know that a low-powered gun allows us to hold the gun in one hand. We want to be up there on the top right. We would like both, but we can't have both because these two features contradict one another. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep one. I'm going to have a really, really high-powered gun, but then I'm going to have a great idea and have recoil like a low-powered gun, but not like a low-powered gun. And a really obvious answer to that one is make it a rocket gun. Turn the barrel the other way around, essentially, and have the open end pointing backwards and <laughs> fire the whole barrel at the... We because invented we... the rocket launcher. However, we get, two, we get two attempts at solving this problem because we could do it the other way around. And we could say, actually, we're going to make a really low-powered gun and we're going to hold the gun in our hand, but we want a solution that damages like a low-speed bullet, but not like a low-speed bullet. So we have a really slow-speed round. And now we've resolved our physical contradiction. This is our solution mechanism. We've taken our technical contradiction and transformed it into a logical contradiction. Something has to be itself, but not itself. So we take our contradiction and we'll continue to provide the maximum of a one and we're going to modify the other one so that the contradiction is resolved. And then we're going to do it twice to save ourselves going through absolutely hours and hours of concept development. I'm going to give you a choice. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six contradictions that you identified. Which one of these is most interesting to you? Which one sounds fun? Leave the ship intact is the boring option because I thought too much about it. Mm. Choose something that no one else would choose then. The two that are left, because neutralize opposition and penetrate armor is basically the same thing we got mm -hmm. between protect yourself against neutralize opposition or mitigate recoil against neutralize opposition. I guess protect yourself against neutralize opposition would be the most wild, I guess. So number one. Yep. Much, much, much later. We're just going to continue hurting the opposition with kinetic energy. We're going to neutralize mm -hmm. the opposition in the same way we always have, with a high-speed bullet. So we want that bullet coming out of that gun at an extraordinary speed. We continue to neutralize the opposition with kinetic energy by just pumping as much kinetic energy into that bullet as yep. we can. As we increase the amount of kinetic energy we put into the gun, the gun is more likely to explode. So we have to find a new way of stopping the gun exploding. Keep the solid lead bullet and then modify the gun. Keep the fast traveling metal projectile. Yes. How does the gun not explode? That's the question. Maybe we apply the kinetic energy to do the bullet in a different way. And we want to put more kinetic energy into the bullet than our barrel can handle. How can we get more pressure into this barrel to accelerate 
perforate this bullet without bursting the barrel? Is there a way that we can put more kinetic energy into that bullet and the barrel can't explode? The gas is not the problem. The amount of kinetic energy we want is the problem. Maybe we could make the barrel longer and then yeah. explode a lot of gunpowder slower. But the only reason the gun can explode is because of the way we infuse the kinetic energy into the bullet. So the problem isn't really the gun exploding. The problem is pressurized gas in the gun. So how are you going to accelerate this kinetic energy around using no pressurized gas? A uh, rail gun. So electric propulsion replace mechanical system. So we've taken a gas system and replaced it with an electrical system. Do rail guns not explode? How could we make the long barrel short and yet still be long? Could we make a gun that can't explode? Because one of the solutions here is spheroidality, which is take things that are straight and make them circular and take things that are circular and make them straight. So it's practically, that would be just about impossible. Unless we curve the bullet with electromagnetic <laughs> railgun that first spins the bullet very, very <laughs> fast and then launches it. We can not make a railgun, we can make a coil gun. Push the round into the coil, then reverse the polarity and then pull the round out of the coil. <laughs> Can you think of another one? Do it in reverse. Do it in reverse basically says take your system and turn it upside down, back to front or inside out. Is there any way that we could take a gun and do it in reverse? That's that's the rocket launch. Let's take a barrel, stick it on a, like a pole. The barrel will launch on a device that looks like the roller for uh, painting. So basically it's a rocket. This allows you to invent the rocket. In an emergency, we can just overload it, fire once and discard it. Disposable gun. We want to protect ourselves from our weapon that might explode, but we also want to put loads of kinetic energy into yep. it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use it like a regular gun. But all of a sudden, Bobby, the space marine, appears. We're going to have to have a far more powerful gun than we currently hold it. Yeah. So we're going to overload our gun massively. Mm -hmm. It'll probably explode, mm -hmm. but it will deliver a round with 10 times the energy that we usually deliver. And then that's the end of the gun. Disposable gun maybe kind of partial action. We don't have a gun that will immediately explode after we fire it. We just have a gun that is overpressured, so it's very likely to fail, but it still works for a few shots. Explodes slowly, basically. If you're facing Bobby, the Space Marine, and you haven't beaten her in the next minute and a half, you probably no longer need a gun. You Problems need an urn now. We're going to continue to provide the same high kinetic energy by propelling this bullet out the gun using pressure. We're going to solve the protecting ourselves problem. A strong gun, but not like a strong gun. Yep. And a gun that degrades for a few shots it has that property. How does the disposable gun stop us harming ourselves with it? A one-shot gun that yeah. totally overstresses the barrel, but how does the one-shot gun not blow your hand off? The obvious answer is move yourself away from the kinetic energy. A gun mounted on a RCI car. If we break the gun, we already sink some energy into breaking the gun. If the gun explodes, then it's just a bomb. All right, we can have a recoilless gun. Maybe maybe let's have a double barrel. Yeah. The inner barrel explodes while the outer barrel protects you. Much, 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 much later. We're going to protect ourselves as we always have with a robust manufacturing and a good shape on the gun. But we want to neutralize the opposition. So we have to find a new way to hurt the opposition. And we want to find a way of getting more energy into that bullet. We want to neutralize the opposition. But if we use kinetic energy to neutralize the opposition, we'll burst the gun. We want to neutralize the opposition in a different way so the gun doesn't explode. Yep. So what is another way to neutralize the opposition that won't burst the gun? We want to put massive amounts of energy into this bullet in such a way that the gun can't explode. The bullet gains the energy somewhere else. Make a heat round. The bullet will deliver its last kinetic energy by itself. The way that we can get massive amounts of energy into the opposition without making a gun that explodes is by making a slow round yeah. that explodes. Well, make the round go slow and make the round explode when it gets to the destination. So basically a, a grenade round. We could just make a really slow round so there's not 
not much gas pressure in the barrel. Mm -hmm. And when the round gets to the target, it explodes. Okay, so now we've got the model of a slow round in our head. We've got a barrel. We don't put too much pressure into that barrel. We deliver the round to the target and then the round does something nasty when it gets there. We don't keep the kinetic energy that's that hurts the opposition. Use something other than a you know solid metal round. So maybe we pierce the opposition deep into its flesh and then use a poison, a very quick neurotoxin or something to okay. you know, incapacitate the opposition. So if I were to then ask you, can you think of one more way? So we're not using kinetic energy anymore. Flexible membrane. Can you find a new way to hurt the opposition using a flexible membrane that is traveling at a reasonably pedestrian speed? I basically fire a net at the opposition. Yeah, absolutely. That was an easy one. <laughs> oh, entanglement. We want a gun that can't explode. And so we want to apply kinetic energy to the bullet in a different way. This Hold one up. is... Uh, I need to go to the toilet right okay. now. Okay. A few moments later... All right, I'm back and I'm now prepared to tell you how I've come to a great idea in the toilet. Well, that's usually the best place. <laughs> <laughs> so how from my cat asking me to be let in to how do we solve this contradiction? Mm -hmm. My cat is named Nero, like in Italian because he's wholly black. Uh -huh. And then I thought of a video game character called Nero from uh -huh. DMC, Devil May Cry. And Nero uses a gun, a revolver that has two barrels on the cylinder. It has a top barrel for the top part of the cylinder and a and the barrel underneath for the bottom part of the cylinder. Uh -huh. If the gun ain't enough, just use more gun. And it reminds me about the, the other video game character. Do you know Team Fortress 2? Yeah. The engineer has iconic line. How am I gonna stop some big mean mother Hubbard from tearing me a structurally superfluous new beehive? The answer is a gun. And if that don't work, use more gun. Now we've got two barrels, both at low pressure. We do same thing as always. You do everything as we used to do, yeah. just twice as more. We want to protect ourselves from our gun, but we want to neutralize the opposition, which requires a lot of energy being slung at the opposition. We need to hold it. I suggested that we don't need to hold it. We need to hold it, but we can't hold it. We hold it first, and then we don't hold it. Gun becomes bomb, and you detonated all the rounds in it at once, thus destroying the gun. Haven't you basically made a claymore landmine out of it? Grenade. Grenade. Because bomb, you usually plant the bomb, but throw a grenade. <laughs> so you basically throw the gun. <laughs> well, let's use the gun exploding as a good thing. Mm -hmm. So don't hold the gun. The gun becomes a grenade. <laughs> yep. Throw the gun. Blessing in disguise. We put yep. loads of energy into the gun. The gun will explode. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> no, it's not a bug. It's a feature. If we press this button here, all the bullets will go off at once, thus turning the thing into a massive bomb. I have another idea. Okay. Twelve o'clock midnight. We could potentially go through every single one of these. We could spend an hour yep. at it. We could spend a week at it. But once you get to the end, the big mm -hmm. question is, have you solved the problem? It's like a list of potentially viable strategies, I call yep. them. Yeah. It's not really a full solution. You're nowhere near solving the problem at this point. All you've done is propose a solution strategy and it results in a question. Of all the uh, crazy things we've suggested on here, do you have a favorite solution to this one contradiction? Use more gun. That once you've got the idea of use more gun, it's actually a question. You're suggesting that the way that we can improve the power of our weapon without exploding it is there. That is a solution to the contradiction that we identified. <laughs> yeah? yeah, I just suggested exactly this. We said there's a contradiction between how much kinetic energy we can get into the gun and how much we have to protect ourselves from the gun. If we put too much kinetic energy into the gun, the gun will explode. But mm -hmm. we want to put more kinetic energy into the gun because we want to hurt the opposition. To which your solution was more gun. Yep. The physical contradiction that we focused on was getting more kinetic energy out of the gun mm -hmm. without bursting the gun. Which separation strategy was employed? Copying. <laughs> So if you suggest a double-barreled gun in order to increase the kinetic power of this pistol without bursting the barrel, what question would you then ask the lab? Can I put two barrels on one gun? Yeah, you could say, yeah, of course I can. Here's an example. Yep. Blue Rose, was it? And that, that's the inspiration. Oh my god. 
more kinetic energy without bursting the barrel, you copy the barrel to process so far. The red parts are the parts that we've done. We've observed the world and defined our desires. So we said what the benefits we're seeking. We've mm -hmm. defined our technical contradictions. We've transformed the technical contradictions into physical contradictions. Then we've tried to separate those physical contradictions to develop insights about the problem. But what we haven't done is solved the problem. What we've really done is created a, a good idea fragment because it only really yep. resolves one of the contradictions. So at the bottom line with this process, all I really have is either a whole bunch of idea fragments or a great idea. Great ideas feel like the solution. It isn't really. It's just a fragment of a solution that is essentially a question. And finally, step mm -hmm. one, list the desired benefits. Where we make a list. Step two, describe the mundane solution, which was a sort of a table. And then find the contradictions between benefits, which was a matrix. And then describe the need for the mundane solution, which tends to be a table. And then retain the mundane solution through a one-sided modification. And then we apply the separation principles. As if we go back to those two characters, Holden and mm -hmm. Miller, these two characters can't solve a problem alone. They have to work together. Uh, okay, so we broke a few laws of physics here. Is there something I said? Maybe now is a good time to get off this rock. For a sec there, I thought maybe we'd lost control of the situation. Arrows just dodged in the boo with a shrug. What's it gonna do when he crawls inside there with a nuke? There's only one way to find out. Crawl in there and blow up the thing that ate Julie. I think it's the best bad idea I've heard all day. Madam Abbasarala, I'm James Holden, captain of the Rastinante. I've seen firsthand the hell that's going on inside Eros, and it mustn't be allowed to reach Earth. There's no time to bargain. We can only choose to trust each other. I pray that we will. Strap in, perhaps max speed. All clear! Clear! Survivability of the crew is questionable beyond this point. They're going to stay with Eros, even if it kills them. Oh, there goes my spleen. Can't take the razor back. Razor back. Catch me if you can. What's going on? I think this thing is taking the, I don't know, consciousness some part of Whatever it is makes us human. Okay. I think she's still in there. Miller, Julie Mouse dead. We both saw her. Yeah, but Junior's the first one to get infected. Brought a molecule infected her. What if she infected the proto molecule back? Your crew is gonna die for nothing. I'm gonna try to reach Julie. If there's any part of her still left, you get her to stop this roxas. And then what? What? And if that doesn't work, I still got my little pal here. You're gonna negotiate with a girl who thinks she's a space station? Well, you put it like that, it does sound kind of crazy. Look, we got one shot here. You don't back off. We don't even have that. I can't do that. We'll lose it for good. Forget the goddamn missile. Get Julie to stop that rock and we'll come in and swoop you up. It's time to see what's what. Julie? You need to wake up now, kid. What happens to us now? Mm -hmm. Die, maybe. Or if we don't die, that'll be interesting. Whatever happens, happens to both of us. It's gonna be okay. You belong with me.
great ideas. It's always funny. What do you think if I got a stand-up comedian or two stand-up comedians? Not engineers, people whose job is humor. And I got them to try and solve an engineering problem and see that what would strategies. Be a great show. It would be like, a great spectacle. Penetrating armor, the mechanism by which you can penetrate Bobby's armor, is obviously connected.